Right. The chair of the property rights committee, uh, probably for the stuff growers. And we have a pretty high level guy here. That's uh, I first became aware of Stewards of the Range uh, through Frank Durant, who I think is a fellow that probably most everybody in the room knows. And the combination of meeting him and listening to him speak uh, and having the need for more knowledge about local government control uh, led me in the direction of Fred Kelly Grant. Uh, he was, uh, he's, he's, he did a, a series of seminars, but he did one in Pierce, South Dakota uh, that I had the privilege of attending uh, with several other folks from Meade County, and I think maybe some of you other folks were there too. And uh, we were enlightened about how we can take back some level of local control. And as we see the diminishment in our property rights uh, coming mostly from the top down, uh, we can be extremely happy that we have people of the moral character of Mr. Grant. This is a man with the capabilities to work anywhere for anyone for probably almost any amount of money with his skill and his background. And he's chosen to stand up for people uh, on property issues. And so I'm proud to introduce Fred Kelly Grant. Thank you, Craig. It's, it's always good to be here. I haven't been here in a long time, but uh, my trips here with Frank were really memorable to me. He was a very close friend, and uh, he was the only president of the Stewards of the Range and, until his death. and, and uh, and I was given the honor to succeed him. Uh, and uh, he was very insistent that one of the first places that we come uh, to present the coordination uh, authority that Congress has given to local government was South Dakota. Uh, I had worked with Hawaii County in Idaho uh, for 15 years. And just very briefly, 15 years ago, Hawaii County is uh, one of the largest counties in Idaho. It's over 5 million acres population of 10,000 and there are roughly 150 ranchers who make up the complete economy of the county. Uh, Fifteen years ago the BLM had a resource management plan which they were ready to issue uh, that would have caused, uh, called for an instant 40 percent reduction in grazing throughout the county which would have meant 100 percent for a lot of people because of the seasons of use. Hawaii County was picked by uh, Secretary Babbitt to be one of the first counties to take the cows off the land. Uh, that was the year, to, the year that they started that was the year that the bumper stickers came out, cattle free by 93, and the first county taken on was Hawaii County. Why? Because it was, it was small in population. The ranchers are not big ranchers. Uh, they're not wealthy ranchers. Uh, it's a high desert forage. So, uh, you know, the, the, the ranching operations are minimum profit. Uh, there's only 17% of the, of the county is in private land. So all of the grazing is utterly dependent on, on, on the federal uh, grazing allotment. John Marble, the most ardent of the anti-grazing uh, uh, extremists, operates in Idaho. And so it was the place to start. I went, uh, one of my friends uh, was a county commissioner and he asked me if I would come out and take a look and see if there was anything I could do to help him. And having worked with the federal government or having worked uh, in, in two governor's offices in Idaho where I was compliance officer and worked with the federal agencies, I didn't think there would be any way to help him and I told him so. I doubt the feds left any kind of loophole that would, that would allow you to get involved. But I went and I looked and I looked at the Federal Land Policy Management Act and it provides in that act that the Secretary of Interior shall, shall coordinate with the tribes, with the state, and with local government. It doesn't say county, it says local government. Uh, and coordinate then is defined. Coordinate means that they have to come to the county or to the local government first before they take an action. They have to come to them when they even start a planning operation, and they have to tell them what they're going to do, and they have to involve them on an equal basis in the planning for that action from that from that beginning moment. And and uh, they have to take into account any plan or any any policy 
that the, that the local government has, such as not reducing grazing except as a last resort if there is severe uh, damage, danger to the resource. Uh, and that's a policy that every grazing county should have. Uh, every, every irrigation district that, that uh, serves grazers should have. The reason is because the next provision of the act says that the agency must take every action practical. Practical, not practical. So they can't use the excuse they don't have the money to do it. Congress very, very skillfully used practicable, which means that if the law allows it, if there isn't a law that prohibits it, they have to make their policy consistent with the policy of the local government. So we, I, I told them that uh, you know it wouldn't be an easy job, but, but it gave them a chance to fight. And it would be a long job because the federal agencies are like Frankenstein's monster, they don't ever quit. If you stop them one time, they'll just come back and just keep coming, keep coming at you. And I told them I really didn't have time to, to help them develop this because I was at that time, I had some, some real big appellate cases that I was working on. My dad was a, a native of Owyhee County and his dad had freighted into Silver City in the old days in the 1860s, uh, freighted out silver and gold from the mining towns. And uh, that night we were having dinner with my dad and, and he said, well, how did you do out in Hawaii County? And I said, well, dad, I found something that will help him, but I just don't have time to help him. And he just nodded. And then when we started to leave, he says, well, Freddie, remember, those are our friends out there. And we got about 10 miles down the road and my wife said, you're hooked, aren't you? I said, probably. <laughs> probably so. uh, and I've been with him ever since. And we haven't lost a rancher to this day. Uh, not one of those ranchers. First of all, we got that plan put off until we could actually uh, uh, make them change it uh, through the coordination process. When that plan was finally put into place five years later, it has no reductions of grazing. All reductions of grazing are dependent upon uh, the resource. Uh, we have some ranchers who have actually regained numbers that they had lost, uh, and we've had no ranchers uh, lose enough AUMs uh, to the point where they are in danger of going out of business. Just last year, uh, we fought the BLM to a, to a standstill and then won uh, when they had missed a timeline on a decision. And we knew that it was going to force the ranchers to go off their allotment in order to feed the cows for the winter. And so we threatened a lawsuit. I threatened to uh, personally uh, ask for disciplinary proceedings under the, uh, in, uh, the Inspector General's office. Lo and behold, at 11.45 on December the 31st, the issue was, dis was, was issued. Uh, they can do it if, if local government is there to force them to do it. They won't do it many times just for an individual. But what Congress has done in the statutes, and it's in every statute, it's in the Endangered Species Act. In the Endangered Species Act, the Secretary can't take any action on any species without first coming to the local government and consulting with them. In, in Owyhee County, the Bruno Hot Springs snail was listed as, a, as an endangered species. The reason it was listed is a, a California professor had come up uh, to, uh, to Idaho on vacation, and he was uh, touring the thermal pools along the, the tremendously long and, and deep uh, thermal uh, aquifer. And he noticed these big black spots on a rock. And it just looked like a big black discoloration. So he got his magnifying glass out and he found that there were microscopic snails that were on that rock. Well, he thought that was pretty neat. He'd never seen those before. So he named them the Bruno Hot Spring snails. Went back to California, um, looked and couldn't find anything in any books anywhere on, on that showed this snail. So he came back the next summer and the spot was smaller. And that worried him because they might be endangered came back the third year and the spot was even smaller and he petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service to list the Bruno Hot Spring snail. Now they listed it on no, nothing more than that because this was, the, this was the time when they were going after cattle in Owyhee County. And the day after they listed it, the BLM sent notices to every rancher along that aquifer that they were going to have to get their cattle off early because they wouldn't be able to use water. There were three operating loans for farmers along that, 
that river uh, that were canceled. They were in the process of being approved and they were canceled. So we went to court, the county went to court along with the Farm Bureau. Uh, and we argued that because the secretary had not come to Owyhee County before he listed that species, it should be set aside and the federal district judge ruled with us on the basis of the Endangered Species Act and the requirement that local government be consulted. Now, and he ordered the delisting of the snail. Well, immediately the banks gave the operating loans. The BLM rescinded its order uh, to the ranchers. Fish and Wildlife took an appeal to the Ninth Circuit. We all know, well, I guess not. You folks don't have the, the privilege of being in that circuit. Uh, it's a real honor to be in the most reversed circuit in the United States of America. But at any rate, the Ninth Circuit actually agreed with him and said that's what the statute says, but we think you went too far in ordering the delisting, so we're going to ask them to do it over again. Well, in the meantime, the fact that the district judge had decided as he did caused the Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, or agency to come to the commissioners and say, okay, we have to coordinate with you. Let's sit down and start this thing. By the time the decision came back from the Ninth Circuit, the county had established enough of a talking position uh, and, and justifying the economic reasons why this thing should not be, uh, why, why the cattle shouldn't be taken off the water, why the farmers shouldn't be removed from irrigation, that we haven't to this day, even though we're now in the fifth year in the review of it as endangered, we haven't lost a drop of water no farmer has had to cut back on irrigation and no cow has been removed from that water. So from a standpoint of practical experience, the coordination process works, provided you work at it. There are a lot of counties in the West that adopted a plan, a local natural resources plan and put it on the shelf and expected somehow that it like a magic wand that it was going to protect it. The four counties that surround the Klamath Basin all had a natural resources plan. Any one of those counties could have called on the Secretary of Interior to come and sit down with them and on an equal basis negotiate that problem with the fish in the Klamath Basin. None of them did it, and you see what happened. They lost all that irrigation water. Now just this past month, two months, once again, the water problems have hit the Klamath Basin. This time it's a little different. This time uh, the government wants to destroy the dams in the rivers up there. The power company has been intimidated into going along with them. The environmentalists are involved in it and the tribes are involved in it and all of them are sitting there just trying to settle these water issues which is going to uh, hurt every individual water right holder in the area. So, Siskiyou County in California and Del Norte County in California this time have adopted a resolution of coordination and this time they're not relying on a plan that's on the shelf they're going forward to implement that coordination and force the government to sit down with them uh, and, and try to come to some agreement that is going to be for the, the benefit of local government which means the benefit of the citizens the ranchers and the farmers who are in that local government Every one of the acts, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, uh, the National uh, Forest Management Act, for the Forest Service, every one of the acts has the requirement in there that local government uh, be considered and consulted with by the federal government. Why? Because the Congress knows, and they don't know a lot sometimes, it seems, but they do know that in this country, the history of this country is based on the authority of local government time of the revolution, uh, the states weren't powerful, regional government wasn't powerful, town meetings are where the law was made, the shires, the, the, the counties, that's where the law was made. Uh, I heard a commissioner yesterday in Montana say, well, if a thousand of you people came in and tried to force us to do something, we'd probably do it. And, and one of the people there stood up and said, well, when did our founders ever have a thousand people come in and try to force them to do something? To the contrary, if there had been a thousand people gathered in the days of our revolution, they would have been opposed to the revolution. It was the most unpopular movement that you can imagine. The people who wrote the papers to the Declaration of Independence did it secretly because most of the people just didn't want this big fight with a government that was violating the law. 
But local government was powerful then. It has continued to be powerful. If you look at, at congressional statutes from the beginning of time, there will be a provision in there uh, that, that requires that the federal government work with local government. Working with an irrigation district in Montana, I found a statute that, that gives an irrigation district the right to go directly to the Secretary of Interior. He doesn't have to worry with anybody on a lower level. That district can go to the Secretary of Interior and resolve any issue that comes before it. These aren't in the statutes by accident. They aren't there because Congress believes in private property rights. They're there because it's the tradition, uh, it's, it's the history, the inertia of statutes that they just continue to put it in there. In the past year, we have 11 counties that now are in the coordinated status. Fremont County in Wyoming was one of the most recent. We have six counties in California and five others that are asking me to come and, and help them put a plan into effect. In Lincoln County uh, in Montana, the county commissioners wouldn't do it. There was a group of uh, ranchers and farmers, recreation users, who tried for two years to get their commissioners to, to uh, force the Forest Service to sit down with them and pay attention to county policy. The county commissioners wouldn't do it. and so. Uh, when they reported that to me and they were ready to give up, I said, go find a, another district of local government. So they found the irrigation district. The irrigation district elected board was more than happy to do it. They were anxious to do it. And so I'll be working with them over the next two or three months, making sure they don't fail, making sure that they bring fish and wildlife to the table where the county commissioners refused to do it. Uh, in Cochise County, Arizona, the county commissioners wouldn't do it, and so there's a natural resources and conservation district that I'm working with over the next few months to make sure they don't fail. And that's been my commitment to these people, that if you, if, if you can't get your county commissioners to do it, uh, find somebody else, find another unit of local government, and I'll help you make sure it works. Uh, that's, uh, that's the way I want to finish up my career, because it brings hope to people. One of, the, one of the real issues that face us today is the North American Trade Union and all that goes with that. The North American Trade Union has been uh, in the works for at least 20 years. Uh, there were documents signed by President Bush, the, the Prime Minister of Canada, and the President of Mexico that in effect waive every right, every sovereign right uh, over the entire Trans-Texas Corridor that, that's being built. That's a three football field wide freeway that's being built from Mexico to the Oklahoma border running through 48,000 acres of the finest farmland in the, in the United States uh, and that's recognized by the state of Texas, uh, NRCS, the federal government. Uh, it's the Blackland Prairie. It's a very special, very unique, uh, spongy type of soil that, that, that holds water they grow a crop there no matter what drought conditions there are, and it will all be gone. This freeway would divide towns in half geographically, and it's a limited access freeway. Uh, so that uh, the, the towns, the emergency crews can't get across the, the freeway. If there's an accident in Holland, Texas, population 1,200, if there's an accident directly across that freeway from their hospital, their paramedics have to go seven miles up the road, cross the road, come back seven miles, pick up the injured and go seven miles up, cross and come back seven miles. It divided physically school districts so that it destroyed their, their bus lines and, and destroyed their school districts. These were award-winning school districts. And nobody, they, uh, the Texas Department of Transportation was holding meetings with thousands of Texans were going in and complaining against this. They didn't want it and they were ignoring them totally. So some of the people um, who were in the way of this, who were gonna lose their places, uh, asked me to try to help them, and I found a statute in Texas that says that the Department of Transportation has to coordinate with a sub-regional planning commission that can be made up of two towns or more. So we found four little towns, total population of 12, 12, or 6,000, the largest is 1,500. They and their school districts formed uh, one of these planning commissions. Uh, I helped them draft the documents, do the letter to the Department of Transportation. 
the Department of Transportation came to them, to this little town, and at first they were there just to explain why they didn't really have to do anything with them. They soon found out they did. Their Attorney General said they did. And so, consequently, they've come back two or three more times. And, and what it became clear is that they were going to avoid these towns. They were going to take this thing around them. Uh, because they couldn't, they couldn't justify splitting the towns and splitting the school districts. And so the effort then was made to form more of these sub-regional commissions so that they couldn't go around them all. There are now nine. Uh, and the Department of Transportation all of a sudden has, has backed up and said, well, you know, we're just going to let the Highway Administration look at our plans and, and we're not going to go forward any further right now. In seven months, these little towns, all of them small towns, brought the Texas Department of Transportation to a standstill on the basis of one word, one word in one state statute, and that's coordination. Now, coordination isn't defined in the state statute of Texas, so it's, we don't have that definition that we have in the federal statutes. But there's a, a, a Texas Supreme Court case that says coordination means equal, not subordinate of equal ranking. And so that's the definition that applies in Texas. And that's the same thing that applies with you folks who are in, in counties or units of local government where you have to deal with the federal lands or with the Forest Service or the National Parks or Fish and Wildlife. That's the same definition. So here's the mighty Department of Transportation in Texas having to come and sit down with mayors and school district superintendents and actually negotiate with them over these problems. We then sent a letter to the <clears throat> Environmental Protection Agency in Dallas, Region 6, and insisted that they come coordinate. And so they came, and I went down for the meeting, and they brought their NEPA attorney in, and, and he spent 20 minutes telling us why they didn't have to coordinate. And then I spent 15 minutes telling them why they did, and point the statutes out, and then he sat silently while they coordinated for the, the, the next three hours, and they've been back twice more since. Uh, the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife has been there. This is, the, this is really, it's, it's one of the most exciting things to these people that you can imagine, because people who thought there was nothing they could do have stepped up as individuals, as small town individuals, and brought to a halt this multi-billion dollar state agency that under the, under the uh, direction of a Republican governor, Rick Perry, was running roughshod over every farming community in Texas. Uh, there's now a lawsuit that was filed, not by the towns, but by another group, and we're filing a new petition with the Federal Highway Administration. I filed one for, for this first uh, planning unit uh, about two months ago, and a, and a reporter for the Fort Worth newspaper called me and he said, you know, as I read this, it reads kind of like an indictment. And I said, good, I'm glad you got that, you got that impression, because that's what it's intended to be. Uh, it's an indictment of all the things they've done wrong. They have violated every rule under NEPA every single solitary rule. And you know, for many years, we all looked at NEPA as this awful weapon that the environmentalists used. Well, believe me, when you use it yourself, it becomes even a more vital weapon than it is when the environmentalists use it. We have used it down there because they violated it. As a matter of fact, when I was in Washington, D.C. the last time, I stopped into the Sierra Club headquarters and I met with the assistant director of the Sierra Club, and I said, you know, I don't understand why you people aren't involved in, in this thing in Texas, because an entire ecosystem is going to be wiped out. Not just humans, uh, but everything. There won't be a species left living. And he claimed he didn't know about it. I kind of believe that, because a month later, the Sierra Club filed a 72-page petition against it with the Federal Highway Administration, and they went through every page of that environmental uh, draft environmental statement and took it apart line by line. So of the most uncommonly unnatural allies, uh, the little towns down there are being supported by the Sierra Club. Uh, 
the petition that I filed, I'm, I'm going to be adding to next week because now we've found in the in the court discovery that's gone on that the Texas Department of Transportation has lied. They've lied to the court. They lied to the Federal Highway Administration. There are documents they didn't provide to the Highway Administration. Uh, and they've now asked the court for 60 days delay in the action so that they can, uh, 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 what did they say, so that they can assess their position. So, so the supplemental petition that I'll file for the little towns is to say that now their credibility is shot. They've lied to the court. They've lied to you. Uh, and you can't, now you've got to just scrap everything. It, it's a fight that, that a year ago nobody down there would have thought could be undertaken. Uh, and it's a fight that's winning. Uh, it, it, in, in every county that we've worked with this year, and that I now have spent the time visiting with and helping them implement it, not just do it and drop it, but, but go and help them through the first meeting with the agencies. Help them get to the point where the agencies know that they understand really what they're doing. In every one of them, we can show progress over where they were a year ago with Fish and Wildlife, with the Forest Service, and with the BLM. So they, and that to me is the only way that we will stop one of the biggest anti-private property efforts that has ever come down in the North American Trade Union, which, which specifically will provide for the Amero. The United States dollar will be gone, uh, and it will be a form of currency that is uh, Canadian, Mexican, and, uh, and U.S. based call the Amero. The Trans-Texas Corridor uh, will have no U.S. Customs Office on the border. The trucks will come in freely from Mexico and they won't be inspected by the U.S. Customs anywhere in this country. The idea is to take it clear to Canada and the only inspection at the Canadian line will be by Canadian authorities. Uh, one of the corridors that uh, is being planned is called the, the Canamex corridor. You, you can see all these things on your website. If you go on, you'll be stunned if you haven't already done it. You'll be stunned at the corridors that are planned through the United States, joining Mexico and Canada. The Canamex corridor will lead from a, a, an ocean port, which China is building on the Mexican seacoast, to Canada. And China then will be able to avoid going through its own port at Long Beach. It owns the port of Long Beach, California. We sold that to China. The problem, so they could come into Long Beach, California without any customs inspection, but the problem is that when they unload their goods from the ships on the trucks, and the trucks entered Los Angeles or Long Beach, then customs inspect it. So they're going to bypass that. They're going to take their goods into that coastal port, uh, port city in Mexico, put them on trucks, take them up the Canamex corridor, and there will be no U.S. customs inspection anywhere no matter where they go. If they unload in Portland, Oregon, there won't be any customs inspection. Uh, if, they, if they go clear to Canada, the only inspection will be Canadian. Now, all of these things were done secretly. All of these things were done uh, basically in the dead of night. And all of these things, uh, if you start to think about, and I just learned today that the Montana Constitution was rewritten in the 70s and there's no northern geographic border of Montana set in that Constitution. So there isn't any Montana border between Canada and Montana. Uh, Mark tells me that there's other states that, that have done the same, some in the south, or somebody told me that. I, I can't remember who it was that I was talking to. Louisiana, for example. So we've got states on our borders, our north and south borders, that are failing to define their borders between the foreign country and them. You know, there was a time when there was a word that attached to all this, but it's a word that Americans seem to be afraid to use, and it's treason. But that's what it is. If you, if you had told, uh, and I've often said this, that the people that drafted the Constitution sat in Philadelphia, and if you've ever been, in, anybody been to Philadelphia in the summertime? Well, it's dreadful, isn't it? It's dreadful. They sat in a room, I've been in that room, a very small room, that shuttered, no ventilation. They had it shuttered because if the people had heard what they were doing, they would have, as Franklin said, they would have hanged them. And while they wrote that Constitution, if you could have told them that in 2008, the United States of America 
would give up its sovereignty through its entire middle part of the country, I think they would have pulled it up and gone home. They wouldn't have suffered through that summer. But that's what's happened. That's one of the biggest problems that I think face private property and individuals today. And, and coordination can help. It's the only thing that can help. Congress won't stop it. And when Congress does try to stop it, as they did when they cut off funds for the, for the trial run of these open trucks from Mexico, the Secretary of Transportation just went ahead and did it anyhow and took money from other funds to do it and told them that she was doing that. And Congress allowed it to happen. So the only way, the only way that I see that, that any of these property rights can be protected is from the ground up, from local government, from the people that you can go and see. You can't go see your congressman. You may get to see some staff member back there. But if you actually get in to see your senator or your representative for more than three, four minutes, uh, it, it's a miracle. You can't see them. You can't discuss issues with them. They don't have time. They're too busy. Often you can't see your governor, and if you could, it wouldn't do any good, as in Idaho. We have a good conservative Republican governor in Idaho who is worthless from the standpoint of private property rights. We have the most Republican legislature in the country, but it's not the most conservative. And we have to watch every session that something doesn't happen that takes away another property right. One of our favorite sayings is that the legislature is in session and no man or his property is safe until they leave. Uh, locally, though, you can see your commissioners. Uh, if it's an irrigation district, you can see that board. You can see them without any real problem. You can walk in and corner them. Most of them don't have a back door out of there uh, when you get into their meeting room. And that makes all the difference in the world as to the effectiveness of how you can protect your rights, given what the federal statutes say. The agencies will tell you, oh, no, this can't be done. The supremacy clause. Uh, rises up and, and we take precedence. Well, wrong. The Supremacy Clause is what allows this to work. The Supremacy Clause says that any statute passed pursuant to the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So each of these federal statutes that authorizes coordination is the supreme law of the land. And when the Fremont County Commissioners pointed that out to their forest supervisor, she just lowered her head and uh, she already knew that. But she was throwing this out as a smoke screen to try to divert them. We've done a good enough job with them for two days that they understood the law. And, and they now are coordinating there, where they've been in a cooperating agency basis for two years and had never gained one foot in any way in the development of the plan. Forest Service was, uh, the, the newest effort there was to close down campgrounds. The reason was that there were diseased trees surrounding the campgrounds, and they were afraid they'd fall over and hurt the campers. So instead of cutting down the diseased trees, obviously, you close the campgrounds. Now, in that county where tourism is a big, big, the only big business left for them, uh, they, can't, they couldn't stand that. They, they're, they're outfitters and guides, uh, and there are many there that would be out of business. So that's when they called for help, and I said, well, you're on your cooperating basis, uh, cooperating agency basis, you aren't going to get there. You've got to do it through coordination. You've got to make them sit down and make their policy consistent with yours. They did that. The Forest Service is now sitting with them. They've suspended their order to close the campgrounds, uh, and, they, and, and they're talking now about how they will solve these problems. Uh, one of the things that uh, I just heard Maxine Corman talk about water rights, and she said she, she, she can read. Uh, reading is one of the most important things that, that you can do at a local government level. The, the agencies don't read. They don't read the statutes. They read the regulations. I've had them say to me, statutes are for lawyers. And, and that's always been a real challenge to me. And before I finish, wherever somebody's told me that, we've made sure that the statute became his worst enemy. Uh, and there have been several who've lost their jobs and been transferred over because of that. The statute is the law, and they do have to follow it. There's a story that I'll tell just briefly, and, and then I want to get on to, to three other issues, all of which can be, can be fought uh, under coordination. Uh, when I was uh, compliance counsel to Governor Evans, Andrews or Evans, I can't remember which administration it was in Idaho, the compliance officer uh, came to me, and, and we had just gotten, he had just gotten a regulation from 
the Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development that said that every agency that had gotten any money through a state planning grant had to have an affirmative action plan. And the affirmative action plan meant that they had to hire in their city, city or county employee employment the same percentage of minority workers that there were in the state, which would have meant they would have had to have 6% black, 3% uh, uh, Hispanic at that time, and uh, Native American and so on. Now, we had little towns in northern Idaho that had gotten a state planning grant to put up a water tank or buy a police car, and they only had five employees in some of those little towns. And it was going to be pretty tough to get 6% of those five employees uh, black. Uh, and, and meet all the other quotas. It couldn't be done. And I said, John, uh, it, it can't be. They can't, they can't mean this. And the alternative was that we were going to have to turn back $30 million that Idaho had gotten from state planning grants. So, oh, he, he, had, uh, he had been with Boise Cascade, and Boise Cascade did whatever the federal government said, had done it for years. He couldn't believe that they could be wrong. And I said, they can't do it. They, they, they just don't have this authority. So I looked at the statute, and the statute did address affirmative action plans, and what it said was, there shall be no requirement of affirmative action plans for any recipient of money through state planning grants. I said, John, it says they can't do it. Oh, they, they found a way. They found a way. So I called the director of HUD in Portland, and <clears throat> I told her, I said, you know, I'm just back here from Baltimore, and I'm dealing with all these rednecks in Idaho. And they just don't want it. They just don't want to yield to this. You've got to help me. Oh, I will. I understand how it is to work with those folks. <laughs> so she told me that she would call me back, and, and we waited for two or three days. And John was on. Oh, he was just on pins and needles. So I called her again, and she said, "Mr. Grant, I've sent that over to General Counsel, and he'll be in touch with you." And I said, "Great. That's great." A week went by. Nothing. He came in really nervous, and so I called again, and she said, oh, Mr. Grant, I meant to call you. We've rescinded that rule for right now. Uh, we'll be reissuing it a little later. And I said, well, that's good. When you do, just be sure and show me the basis for it, and we'll make sure it's carried out. Now, John went to a, went to a conference about two months later and found that three of the other states in the Pacific Northwest had implemented that rule, and they had they had forced their towns and their cities to come up with an affirmative action plan because they hadn't read the statute. That's what we find with the agencies. Your, way, your local government is way ahead of them if they've read the statutes. And those that I'm working with have read the statutes and will have read them by the time we get to the stage of implementation. The uh, Waters of the United States Act, uh, which is just sitting there, thank God, so far, an April 18th hearing as being the latest thing that's happened, is one of the biggest uh, threats to private property that I believe that there has ever been in the history of the country. Uh, it doesn't threaten your water right, it just threatens your use of it. Uh, it allows the Corps of Engineers to basically have uh, undiminished control over your water. And so it's going to be very difficult to ever file a takings action because they haven't taken your water. They've just defined it in such a way that the Corps of Engineers can, can include it in, in all of their regulations. And when the Congress actually has used the good sense to define waters of the United States as including dry pothole, dry desert potholes, you know they've gone completely crazy. And that's what the Act defines. It defines every place that water from rainwater could collect. Every place on the ground that rainwater could collect at any one given time, even temporarily, will be included in the area that the Corps of Engineers can regulate. Now, one of the things that, that we can do, uh, you know, again, you can, you can call your congressman and you can do all these things, and hopefully uh, Senator Crapo assures me that it really doesn't have any chance of passing, but, you know, I've been assured of those things before. I was assured that CARA would never pass, and it didn't. We stopped it in the Senate, but then the next year, they appropriated the same amount of money to each state to, to, to set up wildlife action plans. You have one in South Dakota. 
uh, where your state set up a, 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 a wildlife action plan that puts more restrictions or allows more restrictions on you than CARA ever would have. <coughs> and there's one for all 50 states. So we won the battle and we lost the war. And we didn't even know we lost the war until two years after it had been lost. Locally, what we can do about the waters of the United States is, again, if your local government has, has got a coordinated authority in place, the Clean Water Act that's being amended by those definitions requires consultation with local government. And so anything that the Corps of Engineers tries to do to regulate those waters, they're going to have to come through you if your local government is in a position of coordination. And I don't say don't quit fighting the bill because it's, it's worthy of being fought. But if in fact it slips through or if it gets into some other bill at the, at the 11th hour uh, before the end of the session and it's in with 190 other bills that gets passed, that, you, you've got to be ready. You've got to be ready at a local level. And if you're not, as individuals, you won't have any defense against the Corps of Engineers anywhere they want to work. And that means that the Forest Service can use them, the BLM can use them, Fish and Wildlife can use them, because under a memorandum of understanding which 19 agencies signed uh, years ago, they work together on any ecosystem issue. And so all they've got to say to the Corps of Engineers is, this is an ecosystem issue. We want you to come in and we want you to help us control this water. We want you to help us control the use of water in this part of this grazing section of the West. And they have to do it. That, uh, that uh, memorandum of understanding was another battle we won and lost the war. We fought successfully the Biological Diversity Treaty, and the Senate refused to ratify it. And within a week, that memorandum of understanding was signed by the 19 agencies of the federal government. And through that memorandum of understanding, they can accomplish everything that they could have accomplished under the Biological Diversity Treaty. Now, we've watched that for years, and so far, it hasn't, it hasn't been used effectively. But to me, if, if I were running any of these agencies and I got the power that the Congress would give me through the waters of the U.S. definition, that's where I would go. And that's where I would call on the Corps of Engineers to come in and be my right arm in enforcing whatever I wanted to do to any grazer, any farmer, or anybody else, a recreation user, timber, anybody else using one of the natural resources. Well, all of these things. There, there isn't a thing in government, there isn't a threat to private property that cannot be addressed through a coordination resolution and local policy. Can it be won? Well, we've won so far. Uh, none of the counties that have adopted this have lost. Those counties that have adopted the coordination and are, and are actively implementing it are winning. In Modoc County, which followed Owyhee County by three years, and some of you know that, that I've worked very closely with Modoc County and Sean Curtis through the years, they just recently, this travel management plan that is a scourge of everybody through the west of the Forest Service, they just recently got agreement with the Forest Service that they will leave open every road that the Modoc County supervisors determine to be needed by the county and its citizens for wood gathering, for timber, for grazing, for recreation, or any other use. Now that came through the coordination, not through the goodwill of the Forest Service. Because other places who, who aren't in the coordination uh, mode and, ha and have called on, on them to exercise that authority, uh, they're not getting that, that same result. One of the things that that you convince local government of is that they don't, this isn't a new law, it's not a, it's not, it, they're not creating anything. The Congress has given them that authority. The Congress has served orders to the agencies that they must do this. Uh, and when you find somebody at the local level who kind of resists it, then you write to the Department of Justice, and all of a sudden they learn the law and they say, well, we've really meant to do that all along, I guess we just weren't talking in the same terms. Uh, there are several other uh, real issues that, 
that I think we face. I think the uh, the whole border security issue is one that, that affects private property. Uh, when I was in Cochise County in Arizona, I talked to the sheriff there. In Cochise County, for example, its border is made up 57% uh, of private property. It's one of the few counties in the West where private property makes up a majority of the land in the county. And so where the uh, illegal aliens are coming across that border, in, in Cochise County, they're destroying private property. Uh, they're, they're killing cows. Uh, they're destroying farm fields. Uh, and that's true, uh, according to him, uh, and according to the Border Association of Sheriffs, all along the border. Private property is what's getting, getting hit. Private property is also getting hit by the eminent domain that is now being used by the Secretary of Homeland Security under an authorization from President Bush that he doesn't even have to go to court to do it. He has been freed of all restrictions of the United States Constitution by an executive order. Now that's before the United States Supreme Court right now. We'll see what happens, but, but as it is right now, he can do anything he wants with regard to that wall and private property. He has taken private property. He has taken the property of towns. And now, uh, I guess at the end of September, I'm going down and meet with that Border Association of Counties, of, of sheriffs, to show them how coordination can help them. I showed uh, the sheriff the Homeland Security Act, and, and if you don't think that this local government authority goes all the way through statutes, it's in the Homeland Security Act. It requires that the Secretary of Homeland Security coordinate with local government, local law enforcement. And he read that and it didn't take him long to read it to realize what he could do for those sheriffs. It would put him in a position where uh, it isn't the sheriffs of Houston uh, and Dallas and the big cities that will get all the money because they've been getting all of the money to do anything with regard to security. And under that statute, those smaller counties now will be in a position of, of demanding coordination and demanding that the secretary help them. There's so many other problems that, that we're facing uh, that it would be discouraging if you just made a list of all of them. If you made a list of all of the statutes that are pending in Congress that could kill us all off, it would be very demoralizing. So I don't do that anymore. I just wait until one surfaces that looks bad, like the waters of the U.S., and then keep an eye on it, and, and, uh, and in keeping an eye on it, alert every county that we're working with, every district of local government that we're working with, uh, especially those sub-regional uh, planning commissions in Texas, because it won't just be federal property where that, that definition applies. It'll be on all that private land in Texas, too. Uh, and, and, and getting them ready to deal with these problems as it comes along. I urge all of you to use your internet. Look, look for those corridors. Look, look where they're going to affect you. The corridor that is being planned that, that, that we, hope, we hope we're stopping in Texas uh, ends up in Indiana and goes through Indiana into Canada. Indiana's already approved one complete segment of that corridor. Uh, I haven't you know, I, I should have looked before I came to see whether there are any in South Dakota. I don't know whether there are or not. I, I, Mark? It goes up 129. Okay. Uh, the eastern part of the state over where I live, it, it comes up from like Omaha through Sioux Falls, okay. going up to Fargo, Grand Fork. Well, that, that's the North American Trade Union Corridor, and that corridor uh, is, going to be, is going to be created through eminent domain. It's going to be created through private land. Uh, if you look at uh, if you look at the the guidelines that they put on the map, very little federal land is is taken. Is private land. Now there's a reason for that. I think. Uh, of course, I'm a conspiratorialist at heart. I didn't used to be, but I think it's over a matter of controlling private land and taking it out of our hands and putting more and more in the control of the government. And, and one of the one of the real scary things about that is that they then can sell that to China. Two of the big freeways around Chicago have been sold to China. So China now controls those two freeways. They collect all the tolls from it, uh, and in an event of a crisis, they could close them down. Uh, 
A Spanish company will own the tolls from the Trans-Texas Corridor. Uh, and not only that, but they have the absolute exclusive right to all businesses that will be placed within 5,000 yards of each side of that freeway. So Texas has given over to a Spanish company the authority over all that land in the state. Those things, uh, you know, in, in the old days when I was a prosecutor uh, and a defense attorney, I never liked to talk about conspiracies, except as a prosecutor, because they were easy to prove. And so you'd charge a conspiracy when you didn't have enough evidence, really, to convict any other way. But I really didn't have much regard for people that saw spirits behind every sagebrush that, you know, that, of this one worldism of the UN and everything. But unfortunately anymore, it's not a conspiratorial uh, nightmare, it's the truth. Uh, if, if you look at, at uh, for example, I have no doubt that that's the reason that Montana's northern border isn't identified in their, in their constitution. I have no doubt of it. Because the Council of Foreign Affairs has been making decisions ever since Ronald Reagan left the White House. Every president has been a member of that organization. And every president has been a member of it along with the elite of the liberal causes along the East Coast. And those causes, uh, for example, on, on conservation easements. In doing the history of conservation easements, I found the document that said years ago, it's going to be too expensive to condemn private property in America going to become too expensive. So we've got to use another way to do it. We've got to use conservation easements. If the government can promote enough nonprofit organizations to hold enough conservation easements, it's going to be better than to be able to buy that property at bargain basement prices when the, when the, the owner is put out of business than it will if you go by eminent domain. Conservation easements we've warned about for years. Right now in Colorado, I'm going there in a few days to try to help 200 farmers who risk losing their property. They, they believe that conservation easements was the way they could preserve their property, keep operating it, keep the value up, and also get tax credits. And so they bought into it, and once they got committed to it, the IRS has now challenged the validity of those tax credits and they are demanding repayment. They're demanding repayment of the taxes plus penalty plus interest. And those people are facing payments to the IRS in the millions of dollars. The state of Colorado has also told them that they don't qualify under the state. Uh, they have uh, suspended the license of four of the appraisers who appraise those conservation easements. And these people really have seen the value of their property in one instance uh, go from $840,000 to $125,000. That's the current appraised value of their property. Not enough to even begin to even be security uh, for a loan to pay off the IRS. And what can I do to help them? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to help them. Uh, on the one hand, if you try to rescind them, on the basis of fraud, and I think we could, but then there's no conservation easement at all, and so that the IRS can still come after them, and so can the state. And on the other hand, the IRS doesn't lose. And so I, I, I really don't know. It has me stymied. But, but once again, we face the danger. We see the danger of a conservation easement when you enter into it with your private property rights without knowing all of the dangers of what you're doing. And, and the last thing I'll talk about, because I know I'm about out of time, is the Big Meadows Grazing Association case from Montana, which was a ranch that under the Wetlands Act, they, they sold a conservation easement under a habitat management plan to the government. And the government uh, told them in, in uh, negotiations prior to them making the sale that there would be a habitation management plan that they would have to put into effect and it would cost about $250,000, as I recall. Uh, what they wanted to do was uh, um, recondition a, a riparian area along the stream. And that's all. That's all they wanted to do. And, they, and the government said this is the way to do it. 
they got a million dollars for their conservation easement, so they should have come out very well. The, the, uh, the plan for doing the stream should have been a quarter of a million, they would have had the cash, and they could have continued to operate their ranch. When the Forest Service, or when the uh, Fish and Wildlife, I guess, presented it with their habitation management plan, it was going to cost, I believe, a million eight. And they said, wait a minute, this isn't what we agreed to, this isn't what we talked about. And the government said, well, we talked about that, but we can't be bound by what we talked about. The document doesn't say it. The document simply says that, that you'll put in a habitation management plan, and here's the one we need. And so Big Meadows took the issue to court and argued to the court that the government should be held to its word. The government should be held to the, to the terms of that document in light of the agreements that they had made and the commitments they had made prior to signing the document. And the court said, no, not really. Once the document was signed, all of those agreements by the government, everything the government promised before is gone. And so you've got to, you've got to spend a million and eight hundred thousand dollars on this habitat management plan. And not only that, but the habitat management plan didn't call for just refining the stream. It called for damming the stream. It called for a plan that the rancher had never intended and would not even be conducive to his continuing to ranch uh, as they plan. So when you when you enter into a conservation easement and you think that's the end of it, the feds will leave me alone now and I'm getting this operating capital, the answer is no. They don't have to leave you alone. And not only does the federal government not have to leave you alone, but the Nature Conservancy can sue you. The Sierra Club can sue you under that conservation easement. They can come in and claim that you aren't living up to the conservation easement. They have the right, under every conservation easement statute in every state in the Union, as a third party, to come into court and challenge what you're doing. So if, if any of you are on the verge of conservation easements, think three times and get the best possible property lawyer that you know to read it and tell you exactly what the terms of it mean tell you what they mean in terms of the case decisions that have come down. Uh, every case decision that I've read regarding conservation easements has gone against the property owner and in favor of the easement holder. Why? Because they wrote them. The farmers and ranchers didn't write the easement. They didn't write the document. The people that hold the easement wrote it, either the government or the Nature Conservancy or the Sierra Club. The Nature Conservancy can stand, and maybe they did today, because I've been on the same platform with them in Denver. And they say, well, ours, we don't do that. We don't do that with ours. We act in good faith. Well, I can tell you a story, and I don't have time today, about a case in Texas where the Nature Conservancy acted in good faith and ripped apart a ranch because the rancher wanted to put in a goat shed for a 4-H project for their daughter. And the Nature Conservancy decided that that really wasn't consistent with the ranching operation as it had been done prior to the signing of the conservation easement. So it's easy for them to say to you, well, we don't do that. Uh, if, if they want a conservation easement from you, you have the most precious commodity in the world, and that's your land. And that can't be recreated, and they can't recreate it. So if they really want it, if they really want a conservation easement, then let them do it on your terms. You write the terms. You write what you can do and what you can't do. And you set the price. And if, in fact, they're operating in good faith, they'll do it your way. And you'll be able to test that 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 you will hear every time they appear, well, we don't do things that way, we do things uh, in good faith. I think uh, that's that's all I have to say. Uh, I know that it's, it's gonna be a very busy year for me in the next year because uh, we've got, I, I, I've made all these commitments and promises that, that anybody who undertakes uh, one of these projects, I'm gonna make sure they don't fail but I'm gonna keep doing it until I can't do it anymore, and I think that'll be maybe 10 or 12 years away, hopefully. 
Uh, any questions, though, as long as we have? Mark? Fred, I'd like you to explain the history about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You mean what pursuit of happiness means and, yeah. and the compromise that what? Okay, uh, Mark has heard me do this before, especially with people who, who claim, you know, we don't want to compromise. We, do, we don't want to compromise. The Constitution wasn't a compromise. Uh, uh, there was never any compromise of principles. Well, we all know that life, liberty, and property is the familiar and old-fashioned French uh, claim that, that we all live by, and life, liberty, and, and property uh, was what the slogan was for for uh, Americans. Well, all of a sudden it gets changed to pursuit of happiness. And the reason it got changed to pursuit of happiness is compromise with the Southerners because of the dispute of the word property, including slaves. And they were not going to sign any declaration that said that that all men were created equal. Uh, and that they were able to pursue life, liberty, and property. And so pursuit of happiness was the compromise that Jefferson used. The other compromise, is, if I go just a little bit more, in the Constitution, you know, there are people who have said through the years that you've got to apply the Constitution just the way it's written. Forget about how the courts interpreted it. Do it just the way it's written. Well, if you read the Constitution, it says even to this day, that every black person in America only counts as three-fifths of a person. Now, how would you be if we had tried to enforce that one in court? That was another compromise that was made at the Southern states. So when somebody says to you, we don't believe in interpreting the Constitution, know, first of all, that that's dangerous to you. Because if you don't interpret the Constitution according to what we're fighting today, we don't have the Constitution to protect us. And secondly, you can't impose, you cannot enforce the Constitution in the exact words it's written in, because it in itself would be unconstitutional if you did. So I, I think that's Mark. Mark's loved that story since since a night in the bar that Frank and I were talking stories. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it can be used, uh, uh, and I don't mind you using county empowerment because, in effect, it's power to the county that's in those statutes. We don't have to actually empower them. It's there, but, but that's what it is. Uh, I would say like this. In, in the Kansas people that came to Denver to talk to me about the prairie dogs and the black-footed ferret, a member of their legislature called me last November, just not too long after my wife died, and and I swear to God, it seems to me like I did this 10 years ago. And it was just November when I looked at the date. And I did a resolution for Logan County because they had heard that the Fish and Wildlife was going to introduce the ferret into that county. And I did a resolution for them saying that the policy of the county was that nobody introduce a species under the Endangered Species Act into their county which wasn't indigenous to the county. Uh, and in that same resolution, it called for Fish and Wildlife to coordinate with them or anybody else acting under the Endangered Species Act and come and consult with them prior. That's one of the bases, and they put that into effect, and that's one of the bases upon which I did the letter for them claiming to Fish and Wildlife that they had violated the law because they had violated that policy and therefore they violated the Endangered Species Act. I think you have to use it the same way. A county, a county that resolves against that has to then exercise its coordination authority and say to the federal agency, you've got to come talk to us now about this. Not just, not just in general, you've got to sit down at the table with us. Our policy is against this, and you've got to sit down at the table and you've got to satisfy the statutes, and you've got to find a way to make this consistent with our policy unless there's some specific law that absolutely prohibits it. Now, can we defeat it that way? I don't know. Uh, but it's the only way I know of to try to defeat it. Otherwise, it's going to happen. Uh, the resolutions that are done are valuable because they set the policy of local government. 
but the resolution alone won't do it because they don't have to pay attention to it. They have to pay attention to it only if you say to them, this county is, is exerting its, its uh, coordinate authority under all federal statutes, and we expect you to be here in 30 days to talk to the commissioners or, or whatever unit of government you can find in a county uh, to, to make your policy consistent with the policy of this county or this local government. I, uh, it's worth a try. It, uh, that's what I told the people in Texas, it's worth a try, and look where we got. Uh, so it, uh, it, it is worth a try, I believe. Yes, sir. When you talk about uh, the difference between cooperating agencies and coordinating agencies, in the NEPA regulations, as I understand it, they, they, they address those two issues. They do. That local government, basically, can become joint lead planning that's talk about, co talking about something else? No, that's the cooperating agency. Coordinate, NEPA also says that the agencies have to coordinate their planning with local government. So a local government that first establishes its coordinate authority, if they then want to be a cooperating agency, I don't, I don't have any problem with that, because as in Fremont County and Wyoming, they told them, we'll go ahead and sit with you and we'll help you write the plan, but from now on, you're not going to ignore what we say, because now we've adopted our coordinate authority, and we'll sit at the table with you, cooperating with you, but you're going to have to come back to us and answer then why you haven't included what, what we've done. So it's, a two, it's, it, it's, it's really two accesses to participation with the federal government. So does an action have to be subject to NEPA before that comes into play? No. No, uh, FLIPMA, for example, that deals with the BLM, says any management action. The National Forest Management Act and the forest regulations say the same thing. For example, the Forest Service deciding to close those campgrounds, that is, that is an issue that, can, that the county can force coordination on. We have a prospect in Harding County, in the Northwest Corner, where I'm from, of uh, TransCanada coming through with a pipeline. I'm not sure whether they have to do an environmental impact statement on this, but can our county then, under your scenario, require those folks to coordinate? Yes, yes, yes. I just that that's a that's that's a yes, uh, uh, and and it uh, you know it would then require looking at the agencies that you wanted to notify of it. But yes, indeed, uh, in in Oregon uh, there was a city in Oregon. That where the where the people were really opposed to one of the liquefied gas terminals being placed uh, out on their coast, and and they were being told that that the Public Utilities Commission or whatever the title is in Oregon is the only one that had any jurisdiction. So I looked at one of the statutes up there, and it said that that any citizen or group of citizens in a town can go to their mayor and city council, and if they object to something that the Public Utilities Commission is going to do or authorize. The town has to go represent the citizens against the action. And so that town went to the Public Utilities Commission under pressure from those citizens and defended their position against putting that terminal in. The terminal isn't there yet. I don't know what's ever happened with it. But So the answer is yes. Coordination works where there's any federal statute, including NEPA, that applies. And I can't help but believe that we could find eight or nine that, that would apply in that instance. And, the, uh, and, and remember that memorandum of understanding that the 19 agencies signed, the Department of Energy signed that one too. So that, that's, a, that's a weapon that we haven't used a lot yet, but we're going to be using it next year. Uh, to say to those, to those agencies that aren't part of the statutes that we're referring to, but you're bound by your MOU with this agency, and so you come coordinate.
Yeah. I worked with the state and everything. He went back and didn't drink water after he was done. And I said, there's a difference between cooperating that and coordination. He said, yes, sir. Yes. He didn't have to. No, they know, they know the difference. Yeah. But I, I was thinking, if you get into the coordination on, on the fight we've done down with the three of them, uh, what happens if uh, they come up with the plan and then the environmentalists sue? Uh, in some judge basically. Well, they, one of the things is, is if they do that, if, if they do sue, one of the things that we've never been able to do, we've never been in the position, and so far the counties I've worked with haven't, fortunately, haven't had to do that. But it allows you to go into court as a county to help defend the Forest Service or whoever it is, and now you've got a different statute there that the judge has to look at. He has to look at the coordination statute. He has to look at the congressional mandate that says that they have to be consistent with your policy. Now, will that win in Judge Windmill's court in Idaho? No. Judge Windmill is a creature of the Black Lagoon, and, and uh, there isn't anything that will win there until he finally dies and is removed from office in that way. Uh, but maybe, maybe with a judge who really applies the law, uh, it, gives, it gives a different position. The other thing it gives is this, Mark. The Hawaii Initiative Bill, which I've talked to you about, and I, I don't know whether all of you know about it, it's a bill that we put together in Hawaii County. Senator Crapo has sponsored it. Uh, we were about to have a monument established that would be over half the county. Clinton had two monuments on his desk on his last day. One was the Missouri Breaks, and the other was the Hawaii Canyonlands. And the Hawaii Canyonlands monument would have taken over two and a half million acres of our county. Every rancher would have been out of business. Uh, we, we escaped it because he didn't sign it. He signed the Missouri Breaks. He had promised Babbitt not to sign this one, and he kept his promise for once, and, and for once it helped us. Uh, we knew, though, that something was going to happen, so uh, the county put together a work group. Senator Crapo told us, you're going to have to get the environmentalists with you if we're going to get anything through this conference. So for six years, the Wilderness Society, the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Idaho Conservation League, and Idaho Rivers United. I had to sit in the same room with those folks uh, and, and five ranching groups in the county and try to work out an agreement so that we could settle the issues of, of wilderness. We knew there was some wilderness in Hawaii County. Uh, the canyon, those canyon lands are wilderness. There's nobody that can get in there. Uh, we finally worked out an agreement where the, the wilderness will be 500,000 acres instead of two and a half million. And all of the land that's in wilderness that, that isn't in the canyon lands is, is land that the ranchers have voluntarily said, we'll give this to wilderness if you will trade us federal grazing land in other areas that will help, help us make our uh, allotments more viable. So there's no involuntary wilderness from the county standpoint in that act. We get a release of 375,000 acres of wilderness study areas with the statement in the bill that they'll never be studied again for wilderness. So it'll be the end of wilderness in our county. We have a science review in there for the, for the ranchers to be able to get a peer review of BLM decisions. Uh, th there are several other things. It's, 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 one of the, it's, it's one of the best bills that I've ever seen to protect ranchers. Uh, that bill, uh, we had to do because of windmill. We have to get that passed because it will get out of his out of his jurisdiction uh, some of the things that otherwise we'd be we'd be plagued with. And in, in in the bill we have the provision that the implementation of the Hawaii Initiative will be coordinated by the secretary with Hawaii County. The national environmental groups just raised hell over. They didn't want that coordination language in there because they know what it means. And we finally just said there's no bill that's not in there, and so they backed away from that, and then they said, well, let's define coordination. I said, no, Congress has already defined it. We're happy with it. We'll go with it just the way it is. And we finally, they finally agreed, but they didn't want to. And Mark, it's because they, like the agencies, know what coordination is. They know what coordination can do through local government to protect private property, and they don't want it. Yes, sir. You guys will have to tell me when I have to quit, because you know me, I'll go for days. Brad, you mentioned nature and alignment systems. Some of us have been actively involved in fighting this for three years. It was 
three components to that. The first one is premise registration of your property, which is the is called determining premise. And there's been a great deal of concern of those of us with property rights and rights about, well, first of all, what is the federal definition? Is there a federal definition of what premise is? Hello. Number two, is it in any way yeah. clouding or compromising the title yeah, of your yeah, property? You will be assigned a seven-digit federal number in front of you. And, and yeah. you want my opinion as yeah. to whether? Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I think it will be a cloud on your title. I don't think there's any question about it. I think it's all part of the whole data collection business that where they know where we are at every moment and what we're doing and every piece of property. And what it is is something that they tried to put in the bio, Biological Diversity Treaty and couldn't get it ratified. And they're putting it in this bill. Of course, not only is, are they requiring the seven-digit number for, uh, for your property, but they're also requiring, if this were to come to fruition, second component is the impressibility. That's right. For each individual animal, 15 digit number. That's exactly right. They will know, they will know everything about your property that they want to know which they can get through this one bill. All of those things, in some form or another, were in the Biological Diversity Treaty, which we all got together and fought and, and managed to kill off. And they're coming back. And that's what I say about Frankenstein's monster. They just keep coming in a different direction, trying to accomplish the same thing. Would, would it help us any to define premise? Yes. It, it would help you to define it locally. Maybe you can do it in the state too, because remember, uh, the statutes say coordinate with the state, the tribes, and local government. The only problem with most states is you can't get the legislature to to move. But locally, any 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 county or any city that wants to go against it should be defining it. That's your policy. That's your local policy. In, in the chapter of laws that govern the animal industry board in the state, there's no definition for premises. But in other chapters. So, so if that and, and that would help you if that were a local policy, then you take that and make it your local policy that that's your definition and your base for it is that the legislature has recognized this as a definition, and so your local policy is that's what your definition is, or define it some other way, or define it some other way that's more favorable to you. Uh, and, and what it does is that it gets you to the table. They, they have to come to the table and talk to you. Now, what happens after that? At least we got a shot. And that anymore is all you can ask, I think, in this nation. We get a shot at it. Just as in Texas, we took a shot, uh, and they're hearing it all over Texas. And the same thing could happen. It could happen. Yes, sir? Now, I'm going to change gears on here just a little bit go on an hour on this thing, but anyway, go back 28 years in dealing with the military, Ellsworth Air Force Base, and with the Chamber of Commerce of this city, and the state government, all who don't want to talk about national security, they want to talk about jobs, and they like the base there because a lot of them retire here, and they like this little feeling of suicide mother. In the Constitution, when an army occupied one's court, one's land, for whatever reason, they, I think, stated that you should be compensated. Now we've got a we've got a thing coming in called the Powder River Training Area. The Air Force, and I know that this was put in when they had the last base base quarter commission that. Our senators and our representatives in this chamber of commerce, who've got a full-time man hired who's a retired colonel to the military affairs, they pay him very well and all kinds of money to go to DC and back and forth. Lot. They came up with this plan. This plan was to come up for the next base closure, have another mission for this thing. Now let's remember, this is the most polluted piece of property in South Dakota. So now they want to bring in more exercises 